Hi, I'm Jody Nishioka, and I'm the Executive Director of Communities Rise, which provides capacity building and legal services for community organizations working in communities of color. Hello, my name is Cad Smith, and I'm a consultant with 1226 Solutions, and I've been thinking about and working with organizations on structuring community-based orgs in new ways to be aligned with both shared values on equity and collaboration. And hello, I'm Maha Jaffrey, and I'm an attorney at Apex Law Group, where I work with community organizations, helping them with their legal needs to achieve their missions. The three of us are excited to be with you here today and have come together to talk about alternative leadership structures within nonprofit organizations. This video is part of our alternative leadership toolkit, which was created by Communities Rise in partnership with Communities of Opportunity to support organizations that are exploring alternative leadership models that share power and decision making. We will explore the advantages and disadvantages, examine some examples, and discuss key legal considerations. The full toolkit will be available on the Communities of Opportunities website and the Communities Rise website, and, can, and will allow you to dive more deeply into this topic and provide you additional resources. While this toolkit guides you through navigating the legal landscape of nonprofit leadership structure, none of these materials should be construed as legal advice or any other form of professional advice or counsel. Each organization is unique and complex. For legal or professional advice that is specific to your organization, please consult the relevant professional for your needs. Okay, so let's get into it. We'd love to highlight some of our key takeaways from the toolkit that can help spark important conversations between you and your community partners and our collaborators. So three takeaways from an organizational development perspective are, first, the need for reflective leadership. Leaders who are currently in top-down hierarchies need to reflect on how their leadership structure could be compromising their capacity to be effective and how the organization might benefit from an alternative leadership practices. Secondly, setting teams up for success. Teams that are hoping to roll out alternative leadership structures need to identify how they will take on more responsibilities and to whom they will have increased accountability. Lastly, community impact. Organizations should be able to identify how an alternative leadership model will improve the experiences of the communities they serve. Maha, what are your key takeaways from a lawyer's perspective on this idea of alternative leadership structures? Thank you, Cad. I want to first answer the question that you must all be considering. Does the law allow for such structures? The response is a resounding yes. However, I want to offer three takeaways as you reimagine your organization's leadership structure. Corporate documents. Corporate documents are often drafted by attorneys who may not be privy to the nuances of running a nonprofit organization. There is a lot of latitude under the law to allow organizations to draft them to reflect their practices and values. Secondly, fiduciary duties. Board members have fiduciary duties that require them to act in the best interest of the organization. This duty is not in conflict with leading through alternative leadership models, but rather offer parameters to create an accountable leadership structure. And lastly, clarity and transparency. This is key. Understand and own your organization's policies and procedures. Rethink roles and responsibilities of personnel and craft job descriptions that reflect what you hope to achieve. With those takeaways in mind, Kat, in your work, why do you think organizations are exploring alternatives to top-down hierarchies at this moment in time? I think people want to experience something different. So they're responding to concerns about top-down leadership, both at the macro levels and within the smallest enclaves of our communities. So we've seen the failures of top-down leadership at alarming scale. And while conventional hierarchical leadership structures can still be functional, Many folks in our sector are curious to experiment with leadership models 
that distribute decision making, share power, and more equitably consider how we remain accountable to the communities we serve. For long-term leaders who notice the unsustainable nature of being a sole executive director, as well as emerging leaders who want to embrace new ways of doing and being, I think the momentum for exploring shared leadership is varied. And how do we know if we're actually exploring alternative and shared leadership? I think it's about how people experience interactions that are power laden. So an organization's center of power can be located when we determine who knows the most in-depth information about the most aspects of how an organization operates. So we may be accustomed to seeing a firewall around information, such as around personnel decisions, who's allowed to work with us, who we don't want to, and the strategic direction of an organization. In Tima Okun's work around white supremacy culture, in our orgs, she flags paternalism and power hoarding as two key characteristics that maintain the status quo. The unifying element of alternative leadership models is they attempt to tear down barriers to information and encourage people across the organization to make confident decisions based on having access to good data. Kat, I'm also hearing from many nonprofit clients that they want to explore these structures and break away from the hierarchical leadership structures. So in your opinion, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages that you see of exploring such a model? So I'll start with the disadvantages, and there are three that I'll identify. First, time and energy. So the time and energy it takes to invest in unlearning the ways we are accustomed to doing work within top-down hierarchies is not insignificant. There's also patience with process. So leadership practices become almost ingrained and enculturated into how we show up within our work. They don't just shift overnight. So unlearning habits of power hoarding, deferring to authority, whether it makes sense to or not, and being opaque in how we share information, disrupting these things takes time. Lastly, an explicit why. Organizations need to have a clear North Star as to why this unlearning will unlock some desired experiences for staff, for board, and also help us to arrive at intended outcomes for the communities we serve. So I found that arriving at the articulation of a clear why can feel hard when there are so many different inputs and ideas to consider. In terms of advantages, the three that I'll identify are an abundance of perspective. So we have the chance to give and to get input in situations where previously it would have been much more limited. The opportunity for innovation new approaches from folks stepping into increased responsibility and opportunities, as well as living into our values. So this provides us with a chance to practice what we preach around named organizational values. So whether it's equity, collaboration, transparency, whatever it may be, we can design our leadership model to actualize these values in practice, not just in theory. Wow, to me, those advantages are really where we want to be. And as I listen to those disadvantages, it really strikes me that they're really more about the process and whether an organization is ready to take on this sort of change. As we think more deeply about this, can you share us with us some examples so we can get an idea of what this actually looks like? Absolutely. Uh, I often will encourage teams uh, to talk to other organizations that have tried on alternative leadership models. And I'll start with some personal reflection that my first experience with an alternative leadership model was with a management structure called Holacracy back in 2016. Uh, it was an organizational leadership model that attempted to flatten hierarchies through circle style leadership and clear practices of distributed decision making. The success of this structure was heavily contingent on clearly written roles and transparent communication around decisions made on both tactical and governance levels. So through Holacracy, my interest peaked. Since then, I've seen a trend of worker self-directed organizations that prioritize democratic engagement in their decision-making processes, such as what the folks over at Justice Funders, Sustainable Economies Law Center, as well as Seattle Works are trying on. I've seen leadership models that split the 
executive director job into multiple roles in an attempt to rethink the role of executive leadership and promote self-managing practices across the organization. So heavily leaning on functional systems of getting advice from folks most impacted by decisions, as well as incorporating feedback after decisions are made. And I think the good folks over at RBC here in the Pacific Northwest have publicly shared um, information about their organizational shift in this vein. I think there's a little bit of innovation that goes into bringing any model into a unique organizational culture. These are some of the models coming up in this moment, though by no means is that an exhaustive list. Those are some great examples. And, you know, as you and I have discussed before, there are different leadership structures an organization could adopt. For example, an organization could still have one executive director, but power and decision making are pushed down in a meaningful way to the manager or director level. My job as a lawyer is to listen to my nonprofit clients so I can understand what they want to accomplish and what their motivations and goals are. So with that, can you share some key motivating values that are important in your opinion to consider as organizations explore alternative leadership structures? Absolutely, Maha. In preparation for both the toolkits creation and making this video, you and I spoke to members of RBC as well as Compass Point. And one of the things that struck me is both teams reflected on how their organization's desire and commitment to rethink leadership practices was a primary way to help them live into their values. So I don't believe that's unique to them either. There's some consistent values that come up when we're talking about alternative leadership practices. Two that I'll highlight here are trust and imagination. Trust is a value that helps us to build confidence from having aligned intentions and comparable goals in the community impact we seek. Our leadership structures can be responsive enough for us to trust that we are all capable of stepping into and out of the acts of both leading and following. Alternative leadership structures engender an opportunity for us to operate from a baseline of trust with multiple chances to strengthen it along the way. In terms of imagination, I generally like to put radical before the imagination, as this is a value that my dear colleagues at Compass Point have held and continue to hold. When our individual and collective imaginations are exercised, celebrated, and stimulated, I believe the possibilities for finding solutions become infinite. Systems of oppression stifle our imaginations by design. So naturally, I see it as a critical tool for resistance and for forging the types of organizations, communities, and world we want to see in the future. So what I'm hearing from you is that community organizations are really leaning in to their living their values of equity, trust, imagination, being community driven. And they're looking for new ways of doing their business that reflect those values. So the next question is, is it possible to do under our current legal system? How do the requirements of the Washington State Nonprofit Law and the Federal 501c3 rules impact creating such a structure? Maha, can nonprofit organizations legally have these alternative structures under our legal system? Like I mentioned before, yes, the law does allow for alternative leadership structures. So nonprofits have more compliance requirements than for-profit entities, and all nonprofits must comply with state federal and local rules, laws, and regulations. Firstly, these legal jurisdictions don't talk to each other and so are not always in sync. Secondly, these extra layers of legal compliance tends to stifle creative thinking on leadership practices. And lastly, nonprofit law is drafted by legislatures who may have little understanding or no understanding of the nuances of running a nonprofit organization. So if you want a change in the law, then you must speak up and advocate for change. Some other key things for you to know are, understand your legal documents. In my experience, founding board members draft these documents, submit them to the appropriate legal jurisdictions, and then successor directors never review them. So review your incorporation documents and understand the governance structure and the internal policies and procedures of the organization. 
In my opinion, this should be part of all your board orientation meetings. Secondly, all board members have fiduciary duties. Therefore, they must maintain oversight of all activities and finances of the legal entity and must always, always act in the best interest of the corporation. And then lastly, nonprofits grow organically. They start with volunteers and then volunteers are hired as employees. And during these transitions, there aren't always job descriptions or clarity in roles. So review roles and responsibilities and the processes for employee conflict resolution. So what would be your recommendation for a nonprofit that has decided to incorporate a more collaborative leadership model? So unfortunately, like a broken record, I have to repeat this. Review and understand all your corporate documents, policies, and procedures. Maybe hire a leadership coach to assist your nonprofit navigate and create a safe space for difficult conversations. Consider the strengths and weaknesses of the current organizational structure and identify reasons why you want to explore a different model. Identify key stakeholders to assist you during this process, such as community members, partners, funders, and employees. Consider if you have the right people on the bus. Are personnel in the positions that would help them achieve their full potential? Do the people on the bus share your organizational values and goals? And then consider hiring a legal counsel to do a legal audit to assess red flags and legal risks. Legal risks vary from organization to organization and will be specific to your particular organization and legal entity. And then lastly, I recommend you map out the decision-making process, how conflicts will be resolved, and finally, how the individuals will be account accountable to themselves, to each other, and the organization. Thanks, Maha. We discussed the why, the how, and the what of alternative leadership structures for nonprofits, organizations, and did a deeper dive into how it fits into our current legal system. We encourage you to explore the written documents of the toolkit, which provide a lot more detail and has links to additional resources. On behalf of CAD, Maha, Communities Rise and Communities of Opportunity, thank you for joining us. And we hope this has been helpful for you as you explore alternative leadership structures for your organization.